Last penny. Very last penny. Careful, careful when you open your mouth. You're going to be responsible for what comes from it. Careful, careful what in it leaves your mouth, for you will be responsible for it. It's 1970, and it's an absolute beautiful day in Louisiana. I mean, it's September, October. I mean, it's, it's, the, the humidity's next to nothing. I know it happens twice a year. I get that. It is absolutely a beautiful day. The sky is beautifully blue with a little bit of wisp of clouds here and there. It's got a slight breeze, and I am working for my family. We, uh, we build sewer plants. My brother, easy does it. We build sewer plants for people, for communities up and down the east and west coast, and we're just getting started. And I am working at a plant that has about I don't know, let's just say over a amount of a couple of days, whatever, a million gallons of sewage. And I'm telling you, it's about, it's about the size of our church. And as a matter of fact, I'm about this high up off the water as I am to you. And my father's out there. We only have a few people working with us. And we're doing some tests. And we got to get the sewage from the tank that we're in to the big sandbox so that we can work on our equipment. He puts one man next to the brush rotor, which is like a big aerator, which is a big paddle wheel, keeps the sewage moving, gives it air. He said, no matter what happens, any mistake happens, you kill that switch. Somebody falls in, you kill it, because otherwise, man, they're going to fall in the ditch, and the, there's only one way to go towards the paddle wheel. He tells the other guy, anything happens, you make sure and pull our equipment out, so make sure and tie it off. He tells my brother, you make sure that if anything happens, while your brother's up on that platform, you pull the plug. Don't let that pump run. Everybody got their job. He said, son, you're the youngest. I want you to walk out on that I-beam. You've seen them. He said, I want you to go out there. I want you to pick that pump up. I want you to start moving it. And as it pumps that out of there, within the hour, we'll get it all cleaned out. Fair enough. Did I tell you it was a beautiful day? I'm telling you, the wind's blowing. It's got that breeze, and you can, you can actually feel a little bit of the water from the paddle wheel. Well, kind of water stuff. <laughs> and, man, I am moving and pump, and life is good. And then for some reason, out of nowhere, the top of the pump comes off. It is an oil derrick of sewage. It's 40 feet in the air. It's about yay wide. And I'm telling you, I'm on top of it. It is raining stuff. <laughs> I, it is filling up my boots. It has filled up my pants, my pockets. It is now in my shirt. It is coming out my collar. It is going everywhere. It is raining so hard in this little 10-foot area, I can't even see out to yell. And man, all I can hear is the and my ears are vibrating because there's so much sewage packed in my ear that you cannot hear. It is, I'm telling you, they got things on me I've never even seen before. We got tomato seeds, watermelon seeds, got cantaloupe seeds. I got hygiene products. Wait a minute, what, what you getting all upset with? It was me. Man, I'm telling you, I don't know what to do. And I see the, the rotor gets killed. I see that. And my look at my brother. He's so busy laughing. He is boiled over. He ain't pulling the plug. I decided. I began to yell. I open my mouth. <laughs> so when somebody tells you it tastes like, I know. You may not, but I do. And I can tell you, man, as soon as my mouth opened to curse him from the very beginning of creation, man, I realized the biggest mistake in my life. Could you have just shut up? Man, I, I just start running. It's the WWF all over again. My dad's got to pull me and my brother apart. The pump is still running because my brother is still laughing. My dad finally gets everything settled down. My brother Christ, I've got more pharmaceuticals on me than I've ever seen in my life. I, there's hygiene products I couldn't define. There's seeds I've never seen. My hair is already dried and it looks like a little planet. 
My dad looks at me, and I decide to walk off. He said, where are you going, son? I said, well, he said, you're not going to get any dirtier. Just... <laughs> and I'm thinking, wow. And then he says, the good news? And I'm thinking, what possible good could be of this? He said, you got a tan that will last all summer. <laughs> Dang if he wasn't right. My brother and sister in Christ, careful, careful what leaves your mouth because you're going to pay until the last penny. That is that gospel. My brother and sister in Christ, can I tell you, now we got to remember this, where Christ is in the world. Okay, no, he's not at a sewer plant, which would be very apropos. He's saying, you remember the big Ten Commandments? Well, now I'm telling you they're a little tougher. You heard it said that you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, it begins with lust. You heard it said that you should not bear a false oath. I'm telling you, it's better that you don't even curse. Your yes means yes, your no means no. Any other adjective is a sin. Hence, cursing is a sin. He's saying, you've heard it said that you need to keep the commandments. And I'm telling you, it's better you don't even get angry and lose control. He said, because at some point, you're going to pay for it. So it's better that you say absolutely nothing. Now stop, now stop. You're a first century Jew. These are the things that you need to understand. When he said, I'm going to throw you, I'm going to turn you over to your opponent. In their language means antikido. He says, I'm going to turn you over to the devil. And then I'm going to try to get you to settle up with your brother. So it's better you settle up with him before the devil shows up with you in front of me to accuse you of all the wrongdoings, which he's going to do. He said, and then I'm going to throw you into prison. And I'm not going to let you out, which the only place that could be is purgatory. Because hell, if it's a prison, you'll never get out. More importantly, it can't be heaven, because why would you describe it that way? The Jews believed in Abraham's bosom. Where do you go before the good Lord opens the gates? Moses, Elijah, John the Baptist, Jeremiah. There's purgatory. Oh, yes, they do believe in it, and it is scriptural. Begin with Philippians 2. And then all of a sudden, there's hell itself. Now, to a Jew, Gehenna is what they call Ginnom. It's, a, it's an area just south of Jerusalem. This is how it works in their day. If you worship pagans... And as pagan gods, like we do a lot today, and you offer up your children for sacrifice, you would go down to this place and it would be always smoldering. It would look like a big, like a lava pit of sorts, like a volcanic ash that was still bubbling. They would offer their children up there. And so they believed it was twofold. Gehenna could either be the gates of hell or the purging, depending on what your sin was, of purgatory. So they see it as both ends. That's why he's referencing it, because they got a visual of it. The same way you got a visual of what a sewer plant was like, more or less. My brother and sister in Christ, therein lies the point. Careful, careful what you say, because you'll pay the last penny. You will not enter my kingdom till you're perfectly clean. So when people say, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I'm saved, present tense, that I can still break the commandments, I can still cheat and do what I want to do, caught up with pornography, drink too much, alcohol, drugs, this addiction, treat people wrongly, dishonor my parents and not go to mass. It's all a lie. For every one of those commandments you break, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit will be watching. I told you that back in um, at the very first reading, right? I, I told you again at St. Paul, and I'm telling you now, careful what leaves your mouth because I'm going to hold you accountable for it. Look, our best players... Our best players, for example, in the Garden of Eden, their names are man and woman. Adam, Adamah means ground. And they don't get their names per se till after they're kicked out of the garden. Therefore, Adam resumes his name and Eve picks up her name. She is woman in the garden. If God is giving everybody a mulligan and that once saved, always saved, then why didn't Adam and Eve get to stay in the garden? Why'd you kick them out? I mean, Moses was in the desert for 40 years. Oh, my God. One million people? You think we complain. Look in their world. One million people. And do you know of the one million people that got caught up in the desert? How many eventually make the promised land? Two. They stay in the desert 40 years for everybody who worshiped the golden calf has to die off. If they didn't get a mulligan... If Moses doesn't go to the promised land because he hits, he hits in the, the rock, if you will, twice. If Adam and Eve doesn't get a mulligan, then why do you and I get one? 
We don't. Therein lies the point. So what I'm asking you to do is to be guarded about what you say and what you do. So, for example, you're driving down the street, and it's a beautiful day. I mean, the birds are chirping. they got the right song and the music. And the guy in front of you has now been turning for six blocks. I mean, that blinker's just been going, and he's driving it like it's a beautiful Sunday afternoon. The problem is it's Monday. Do you drive around him and give him the look? That's on you. My brother and sister in Christ, do you drive them around and kind of give them a gesture? That's on you and I. Does somebody drive around and give you the gesture? And then you in turn tell them they're number one. My brother and sister in Christ, how do you respond when you get that email from that person that you never expected it from? What about you get that text message or you get that, that call or you get that letter? How do you respond to that? Just because somebody throws garbage at your feet, nobody told you to pick it up. I don't understand. Why would you want to sin with the same person that you don't care for to begin with? And if you really don't believe what other people think of you, and if you really don't believe what other people think of you, then why do you care what they think of you? Why would you even commit a sin to the person that you say it does not matter? The truth of the matter is what other people think of you and I is none of our business. There's only one person that cares. Mother Teresa was right. People are unreasonably illogical and self-centered. So why are now we taking counsel with them? When you go to work and they start asking you to do things that are not in your job description or not worth your money, then why are you complaining about it? You're a good Catholic. That's what we do. You're not defined by who you are, my brother and sister in Christ. I mean, I'm, as a professional, you're defined by whether or not you're truly Catholic, true to the Catholic faith. I'm a good Catholic businessman. I'm a good Catholic teacher. I'm a good Catholic this. I'm a good Catholic that. At the end of the day, the nanosecond, listen to what I'm telling you, the nanosecond you die, all that goes away. Nothing else matters. There's only one thing on the plate now, judgment. Mercy takes place from the day you came into the world until the day you went home. The only thing left is judgment. You're not judged by your 401k, which is probably a 201k. You're not judged by your resume. You're not judged by your job, the number of people you had, the camp, your golf clubs, your game, whatever, you're only judged by your actions. Therefore, why not take counsel with it now? My brothers in Christ, when you get that phone call coming home to pick something up, man, you just offer up the sacrifice. You get in the line at Walmart, and there are 500 people and two checkout people. Why are you shocked? You know that's how it's going to be anyway. You knew that walking into the door. My brothers in Christ, why do you get sideways when the same people call, and you keep thinking, how could that person possibly be made king? Doesn't matter. You already know they've been made king. Why does it get you upset when the president says something and you know he has not the capacity? You think he's going to get better without praying for him? My brother and sister in Christ, I'm telling you, the only thing that matters is how you and I respond. Be careful of what you say, for tomorrow you may have to eat it. My brother in Christ, be careful of how you think and you act. Can I tell you just to pause Pump the brakes for just a second. So therefore, you don't say something that you're going to spend the next two or three days regretting that you'd even said anything. Now we spent three days over a 20-second issue. The fact of the matter is, you may have some regrets. Oh, I wish I would have said this. Or I wish I would have done that. Well, don't worry. The devil will give you another chance to do it. My brother and sister in Christ, I leave you with the words of all people. Captain Jack Sparrow. Yes, what, um, golly, Captain Jack Sparrow. He said, you know, the problem isn't the, you know, I practiced that. I just want to let you know that. The problem isn't the problem. The problem is your attitude and reaction to the problem. Amen. 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 Name of the Father and the Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Please stand. And for the record, the tan was fantastic for the next year. Just stand there that. <laughs>